everyone and welcome back to the Never Chain Talk Show, a Life Without Limbs production. I'm your host, Nick Vujicic, and I'm so glad that you've decided to join us today. This month, we are discussing addiction, and I'm pleased to introduce to you our amazing friend, Brother in Christ, co-ambassador of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, standing in front of the gates of hell and redirecting traffic, our very special guest, Ron Brown. Ron is the executive director of Teen Challenge Southern California and oversees, get this, it's 10 ministry locations just in that one state. He is passionate about leadership development and encourages pastors and Christian leaders through conferences and seminars locally, nationally, and internationally. As a friend of mine for now many, many years, I've had always admired Ron's heart, humility, passion, endurance, and just a brother relentless pursuing the brokenhearted and seeing the captives free. Ron, my brother, I love you, and it's an honor to have you with us today. Nick, I love you too. Thank you so much for inviting me, dear brother, to be a part of this amazing ministry outreach that you have. Uh, I honor you, I bless you, and I just thank the Lord for our friendship and all that you do for the kingdom of God. Amen. I love you so much. And I want to preface this for all of our audience, young and older. Um, you know, I, I, I'm I actually so blessed to have such uh, a, 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 an enriching experience of life, the ups and downs. Uh, we all know that the more you live, the highs seem higher, but especially the lows seem lower. And as we journey on through this life where we come to points that we come to the end of ourselves or the understanding of the limits of our strength, our plans um, that fail us, our strength that fails us, you know, uh, this theme uh, of addiction, I, I think we're speaking to anybody and everybody who actually has humility that, that we must admit to one point. We've all had some kind of addiction and whether that's substance addiction, uh, some of us even surrounded with family members uh, with addiction, some infliction upon us because of other people's addictions. I mean, this is a topic that I really believe um, touches us all in some way, shape or form. Indeed. And uh, let me just tell our audience, let's buckle up. And uh, let's take a deep breath in and out and say, thank you, Lord, that thank you Lord. can set us free. Thank Amen. you, Lord, that you can <laughs> heal us. Thank you, Lord, that you're with us. Amen. Amen. Um, <laughs> thank God for Jesus. Uh, Ron, mm. I wanted to just do that preface because it does affect us all, young and older, and from all walks of life. But before yeah. we do talk about today's topics and the questions that I have for you today. I always want to start with asking our very special guests here, how did you come to know Jesus and how did you actually be led by his Holy Spirit to do the work that you are now doing with many people? Wow, well, thank you, Nick. I, I uh, was led to the Lord by my father, uh, who was an elder in the church for more than 45 years uh, before he went home to be with the Lord. And so all of my brothers and sisters, I have seven of them. Uh, we were raised in the church, going to Sunday school every Sunday, uh, hearing the gospel. And I literally came to faith for myself because you can't really live on the faith of your parents. Uh, when I was nine years old, I opened my heart. I repented of my sins and I received Christ as my savior when I was nine. Uh, I was baptized when I was 10 in water. Um, and I've been trying to follow the Lord ever since, certainly not perfectly over those years. As you know, you grow and you go through all kinds of things in your life. But God has been a part of my life personally since I was nine years old. Um, my mother, while we were growing up, was an alcoholic. And so I grew up in a home with a father who was completely dedicated to the things of the Lord. 
uh, and a mother who struggled with, uh, with alcoholism. Um, I wouldn't say that that was really the impetus that led me into the work that I'm doing now, but I'm sure it probably had some impact, maybe subconsciously, because uh, that didn't seem to be the trajectory uh, of my life initially. Uh, I was doing other things. I was in the military for a season and did some other things. But it was about 25, almost 30 years ago, a friend of mine, uh, I found out was addicted to cocaine. And I did not know. Uh, I went over to his house one day and I couldn't find him. Uh, he would do these disappearing acts and and I wasn't aware of how the whole addictive mindset worked. It's a very lonely place to be when a person is addicted to, to anything. Um, and so he finally admitted that he was addicted to cocaine and we were able to get him some help. Uh, and then God led my wife and I on a journey uh, of really reaching out to people in our neighborhood who were sleeping on park benches, who were addicted, uh, they were homeless, um, we heard a message on uh, on a Sunday morning from our senior pastor say, what are you doing to impact your community with the gospel? And I'm thinking, well, I, I teach Bible study here at the church. I, I, I minister the word. I'm doing things in the church. And my wife and I said, well, what are we doing in our own community? Uh, and so she said, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll make some soup and we'll go out and just start talking to the people who sleep on those benches in the park near our home. And so she did. She made a crock pot of soup. And we went out and start feeding people, just talking to them, getting to know their story, how they ended up in the park, uh, either as an alcoholic or a drug addict, and just loving on them, just getting to hear them. Uh, and then we would uh, literally take them to our home, get them a shower, get them clothes. Uh, many of them started coming to faith in the Lord, um, and they wanted to know more about God. So we started a Bible study in our living room uh, with about five other um crack cocaine addicts at that time. This was back in the early 90s, late 80s. And God just began to miraculously transform them. And so our hearts were just drawn into this world that we were not aware of. And over the years, God has led me uh, to, to the place that I am now uh, at Teen Challenge now for 20 years, working with those who are addicted to all kinds of life controlling issues. It's amazing. Um... Praise God and thank you for your service for the freedom of our country as well, Ron. Oh, um, thank you. Let's talk about the issue of addiction today in America, uh, the opioid epidemic, um, the overdose of young people. Um, yes. Where right now um, we're talking about a declaration of a public health emergency. Uh, obviously, it's not getting any media news, and we know that there are many factors as to why this is even happening and allowed at some way, shape, or form to, to just freely continue to go on in an uncontrollable way. Yes. Uh, there are local governments uh, up in Northern California that are freely giving cocaine to the homeless right now mm. today. Um you know, when we look at the, the prevalence of addiction in our country um, and our society, um, you, what do you think and believe is actually driving the, in particular, opioid epidemic, um, um, epidemic um, and, and the root of this in our nation? Well, I think it's an attitude uh, overall that is pervasive in society about addiction. Uh, because we've had the the legal uh, addiction of alcohol for for many 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 years, uh, and that has really kind of desensitized people and kind of made folks who are addicted the butt of jokes, uh, and so it became kind of uh, acceptable uh, in in our in our culture, uh, which led into all these other things. Of course, we've had heroin and cocaine has been around a long time, but as you mentioned, fentanyl and the opioids, especially the synthetic opioid uh, fentanyl, has really brought so much death and destruction uh, over the last you know, 10, 15 years. It is just astronomical, the number of people who are losing their lives. What drives it is people are looking for answers. They're looking for solutions to all kinds of issues in their lives. And unfortunately, they're reaching for the wrong solution. They're, they're looking for escapism. Uh, and as a result, uh, they want to get high. They want to just kind of 
numb themselves for a while. Of course, young people, they just get introduced many times. They just want to have some fun uh, and they don't realize that they are really playing with something that's more powerful than dynamite that will really blow up their future in their life. Uh, but people are looking for escapism. They're looking for all kinds of ways to cope with the pressures and the stresses of life. Uh, and so drugs offer some relief for a little while. But there's another side to the addiction that doesn't bring relief, but brings bondage and, and brings hopelessness and brings addiction that really destroys folks' dreams and their lives. Uh, so there's a desire in people uh, really to, to be fulfilled. And I believe that is something that God put inside of every single human being. And unfortunately, people are reaching for the wrong thing. Of course, you know, we can look at the pharmaceutical industry and, and how things are overprescribed and how that has led to opiates being so pervasive um, in our society. All of those things are there. They're all factors. But if there was no desire for these things from those who are procuring them, the market would dry up. And so we really have to work with folks to help them to realize that there's another way that they can cope with the pressures and the stresses of life that don't involve alcohol or drugs. Look, if you're watching this and you're like, well, I'm okay. I don't have an addiction to a substance or alcohol. Um, what's your addiction? I mean, we're talking about addiction, the way that God has made us. Um, we know when something's wrong. We know when there is a void, there is this gap, there is a vacuum in our soul, a God-shaped hole, only a God-shaped hole in all of us that only God, his purpose for you, his design for you, for the best life that he has for you and knowing him and, and waiting for eternity with that not being filled up with God himself, that is where in what Ron was referring to, how we then go to escapism or something to even distract our mind of the pain, um, of the fear, of whatever emotion that is, even boredom. I mean, we're talking about addictions. The nature of addictions is in the human nature. In our human nature, we are we have addictive personalities. It's not like, oh, here's an alcoholic. Oh, here's a drug. What's your uh, uh, choice of addiction, right? And, and that's the incredible, the, the the incredible wool over the eyes of most of us. Or well, at least I'm not addicted to that or that. No, you're addicted to your phone. No, you're addicted to money. No, you're addicted to an, emo an, an ideology of an emotional affair when you're married with someone else. You're addicted to this uh, idea of when you get to some sort of status of life or recognition or enough Facebook likes or whatever. Um, this addiction to, I need a boyfriend. I, 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 Ron, you know how many young Girls are saying, I, I need a boyfriend to feel love. Nothing's changed for decades. Oh, no, no, no. It's this addiction to even this idea that you're complete once you add something into your life and that being not Jesus. Um, and and the, the idea is that when you bring God into that God-shaped hole, in our spirit, in our mind, in our daily walk, that when we do start walking with Jesus Christ, as you got baptized at age 10, that you don't walk perfectly with God, but you hunger and strive for righteousness and God's perfect will for your life. Um, that's when your emotions, step by step, reading the word, praying um, every day, and, 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 and being with him in communion. Um, in that essence, Ron, there obviously during the imposed isolation period of COVID, we saw obviously a dramatic rise of substance abuse. You know, a lot of even Christians, um, you know, were out of rhythm and now they, you know, need to some, some things that, uh, you know, could hide from their own family. Now they have to face the music. 
um, yes. uh, you know, and, and stress, um, mm -hmm. difficulties, uncertainties for all of us. Um, Absolutely. We've obviously seen all across the board a dramatic rise of substance mm -hmm. abuse. Um, I want to ask you, what does this reveal about the nature of addiction? And explain to us what you saw happening during this time. Sure, Nick. Well, what I often say is we are all addicted to sin. And out of that addiction to sin flows all the other things that we look for, all the other crutches, uh, whether it's, you know, sexual immorality, whether it's drinking or uh, opiates or heroin, whatever it is, uh, it flows out of that brokenness. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So every person is addicted to sin. And so the only thing that can break that addiction or, or, or break that mindset or that heart set is to have a transformation that comes from a relationship with Jesus Christ so that we're no longer addicted to sin, but now we are free to make choices to serve God, make choices to love our family, to make choices uh, to, to stay away from things that cripple us in any way to keep us from living out the purpose for which God created us. You talk about that God-shaped part that is inside of each one of us. Nothing else can fill it. But because we have this addiction to sin, we fill it up with all kinds of things. Paul talks about the works of the flesh and, and he names those things in Galatians chapter five. And, and so all of those things begin to take, uh, fill that void. But the, the, there's, a, there's a, a time release, <clears throat> if you will, uh, that brings destruction because the very definition of addiction means that you're out of control. You are no longer in control. Maybe when a person starts playing around with drugs or alcohol or whatever their addiction is initially, they feel that they have some control. So they think they can control it. But in, after a while, the control is gone um, there's a change that comes over them and now they're out of control. And that's really what addiction is. It's the inability uh, to, to stop those impulses. And only God by the Holy Spirit gives us the ability to, to be free to make the choices of what we ought to do um, and rather than what we think we should do based on our feeling in the moment. Uh, but you're right, the pandemic and the isolation uh, really... Uh, exacerbated the whole addiction mindset uh, over the last few years. We were built for fellowship uh, by God. We were built for relationship and anything that interrupts our ability to connect with God and to connect with others really causes us to go on a, a, a spiral. Um, and, and the door is open for whatever uh, the enemy has to offer to us that connects with our addiction to sin. And that's why we need the gospel. We need the freedom that only God can give because there's something that comes that's greater than our addiction to sin. And that is the power and presence of the Holy Spirit in our lives that gives us the ability to reach for something greater uh, than those things that have really held us down for so long. Amen. Um... You know, uh, f for me, Ron, uh, I know when I was a teenager, right, I saw pornography and all my friends were struggling with masturbation as well. Um, and it's, mm -hmm. it's like Apostle Paul. I love his writings where he says, a wretched man I am. I don't do what I know I should be doing. And I do the things that I ought not to do. Um, and mm -hmm. that that struggle, that wrestle. And at a certain point, that numbing of the, the sin and conviction where you know it's wrong, it's that sharpness. And the, the time you go for the second time, the third time, the fourth time in, in drugs or alcohol or this or that, you, you basically have a choice. That, that conviction gives you the awareness that you need to now be making the decision, are you going to walk away from it? Or are you going to, in some way, shape or form, numb yourself, justify yourself, or start drowning yes. bit by bit in mm. that shame mm. and guilt yes. to the point that you feel like there is no way out anyway, and this is where you're always going to be. 
And that's why God yes. doesn't love you. And that's why he'll never receive you and look at you, you wretched old man or young man or young woman. Um, we all have this struggle. Um, and and I, I just want to say to every single person out there, uh, you know, that, that we must understand that it's way more than our own strength. It's about powers and principalities of darkness. And it's in that moment, as Ron was saying, that it is by the Holy Spirit that then by his grace and mercy, you choose not to sin. You choose to say, I turn away and repent. Now, if you turn away and repent and you're following that sin again, like we all know the struggle we're in. OK, now we again have a choice. I now need to ask other people to pray for me. Find a trusted person or a Bible study um, or someone to pray over you and help you walk through this. If it's a more complicated addiction, such as sexual immoral immorality and sexual immoral tendencies, you know, that there's other incredible people who have actually recorded their testimonies. Um, Cy Rogers, um, other people of not just sexual immorality tendencies, but stay uh, in the lane that God wants them to stay in, no matter what our tendencies are. Are we not all tending towards sin, addiction to sin? Does it matter what sin it is? So God then gives us the wisdom to also be inspired by other people who've also been experiencing that particular addiction. That's why we're doing this, Champions for the Brokenhearted. That's why we're sharing all these testimonies and stories of people that are helping others be free from the captivity of whatever that is. Last month was abuse. This month is addiction. We all understand that all these types of prisons and prisons and captivities are different all across the board. But even within the topic of addiction, this always come back, comes back to the root of sin, the powers and principalities of darkness. And, and I love it how you even say, Ron, um, that, that, you know, it's not about getting people to stop using drugs. It's about giving people another reason to live. I mean, this is what the, 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 the vacuum is. If there is no purpose for my life, and this is where I'm at, and I can't get out of it, and there's nothing really to look forward to, and I'm being abused, and I'm scared about the future, and no one can show me the, the proof of God's existence, are you kidding me? We got to seek out that greater reason to live. Seek out who greater the person to tell you what you know purpose you're to live out than the person who designed the purpose in you. God, it, this is a powerful statement where you need to seek God, the one who created you for the reasons to live and run with your extensive experience as it, why it's important to address addiction as the symptom of a rooted problem. It's not the problem. It's the symptom of a deeper rooted problem. Absolutely. Expand on that. For it's us. a symptom. Yeah, it's a symptom. And sometimes it's a faulty solution uh, because addiction will work for a season. You know, sin has pleasure for a season, but oh, when that season is over, uh, there's a, a, a reaping of a, of a reward that you really don't want to, to, to take. Uh, and so that's why we, you have to have your life centered and grounded from a different place. God created us to worship him. God created us to serve him. God created us to love him and to love our fellow men. And anything that brings us out of alignment with the, our created order, the way God designed us, it causes us to, to limp through life and look for all kinds of crutches uh, in order to lean on so that we can have some sem semblance uh, of a balance in our lives. But it really is an imbalance because the only thing that can balance us and bring us to that place of peace uh, that place of shalom uh, is a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, Paul talks about in, in 2 Corinthians 10 that we have these strongholds um, of the flesh. 
and strongholds of the mind, of the imagination. And those strongholds have to be dealt with. And I really love what you said, Nick, that they can't, you can't isolate. You have to be with other people. And I think that's one of the things that make Team Challenge work is that we have a community, a safe community that is developed so you can share those issues that you're struggling with so someone can to, can help hold you up and help lead you along. Uh, addiction is a very isolated thing. Uh, when a person is addicted to whatever they are addicted to, there's shame that goes with it. And that shame drives them into hiding, drives them into isolation, uh, and drives them into a dark place so they can't see the light to find their way out. We need God, we need the Holy Spirit, and we need one another. That's why God, uh, that's why Jesus created the body of Christ, because he knew that people would need one another. Uh, and so that is part of our approach to helping a person break free from their addiction is to bring everything to the light, to come out of hiding so that they can really receive the fullness of God's truth, the fullness of God's love and acceptance to know that God loves them just the way that they are, but he also wants to bring them to a place where they can be free because he, don't want to, he does not want to leave them in that place of bondage where the strongholds of the mind and the imagination captivates them and keeps them away from their true purpose, true identity as sons and daughters. Amen. Of the and the tricks of the devil, he is so sneaky. Well, I was born with mm. this. This is this is prevalent in my family. Okay. I mean, the last time I checked, we all had genealogy to Adam and Eve. Right? And we're all well, hello. Born sinners. <laughs> we're all born with yes. tendencies that are sinful. Um, and so, you know, some of us feel like, well, then I'm condemned because my my father was an alcoholic, his father was an alcoholic, and his father no, God is the God of redemption. God is the God of breakthrough. When you call upon him and call upon his name, you will be saved. That Jesus is Lord and Lord above all, the only God uh, who is alive. God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Um, that God whose son Jesus Christ died for you and rose again, that's the God that we speak of. Um, and we just want to tell you, we love you. We love you. There is no addiction that surprises God. He, he, Despite our failures, despite the fact that he knows all the things we failed in, he still has a love that pursues you. He pursues you. Um, we want to tell you, we, we, we know God's pursuing you right now, even as we're speaking to you right now. It's God telling you he just loves you. Ron, um, listen, addiction is often, as you know, stereotyped. Um, tell us a few misconceptions as well on, on, a, on a different level that some may have towards those people struggling with addictions. Now we've talked to the addicted, but what about the people who know others who um, do have an addiction, the, the misconceptions that we all have looking at, quote, quote, those people. Well, but for the grace of God, so go I. I think the, the key is for everyone to really stay close to their own story. Once you walk away from your own story of redemption, you walk away from your own story of how God met you in a dark place and brought you to the light, then it can cause an attitude to, to start manifesting in you to believe that somehow there's some exceptional way that you are made that's different than the way the other person next to you is made. We're all made the same. As a fact, matter of fact, the Bible declares that God remembers that we're just dust and we're all dust. He formed us out of the dust of the ground, and he remembers that we're just dust. Uh, but Psalm 103 says, bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all of his benefit. He heals us of all our disease. He delivers our lives from destruction, uh, and he does all these marvelous things of restoration in us in this dust that he made. But we're all made out of the same dust. There are misconceptions about people from different neighborhoods or different economic uh, uh, levels of living, uh, all of us have access 
uh, in some way to things that will destroy us. Amen. Amen. Uh, and therefore, we're all in this thing together. We're level at the foot of the cross. We're all in need of the Savior. We have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ. He's the one who's fighting for us, defending us and holding us and beckoning us to come into freedom and to walk away from all of the things that separate us from God and separate us from one another. And so we have to reach out to him. He says, call on me, seek me with all of your heart and I will be found by you, says the Lord uh, in Jeremiah 29. And so God, he, he's, all, he's listening, his ears are open his heart is inclined to receive us. He does not reject us. Jesus, he took on the form of a servant. He humbled himself to the cross and he took the, the shame and he took all of the scorn so that we don't have to live that way. We can bring all of our shame, all of our scorn to him. But if we ever walk away from the thanksgiving of what God has done in our lives, then we can develop an attitude that makes us feel that we're somehow stronger than we, when we, than we really are. We need the Lord, everyone does. And so it's from that place of humility, from that place of thanksgiving, from that place of great graciousness of what we've received from God that we need to extend to others. Freely we have received, freely give. And so it's that giving aspect, living a life of generosity uh, towards others helps us to be a conduit uh, of healing and help uh, rather than a destructive person who brings about shame. Amen. Brother, we can preach, man. You and I on the stage, man. We can <laughs> um, preach it, brother. That's awesome. Um, many people see my disability, right? I have no limbs. You can see my disability. If you know someone's struggling with an addiction, it's almost like, well, you know if someone has a cancer or not. But do you know that if someone has uh, some kind of substance addiction and you don't, but you lustfully put your eyes upon a woman, um, that to God mm. is the same separation of between God and man that he closed through the blood of Jesus Christ, whether you've been addicted for 40 years. I mean, I've seen someone who actually started human trafficking in 1965 in Mumbai, India, 40,000 human trafficked women, blood on her hands, pain on her hands. We're talking five decades of pain, 40,000 souls went through pain and abuse and trafficking because of her. And she was paralyzed and we prayed for her and God healed her. Um, and she actually walked for the first time in five years. Nothing separates you from the love of God. And that's the shame that everyone has on some kind of level. But you're right. I, I love the way you said that we're all level at the foot of the cross and we all need each other. And let me just tell you, if everything's hunky-dory and you're going to church on every Sunday and blah, 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 or you're just comfortable in your PJs now watching online, are you kidding me? Get to work. They're all around you, these people who don't know Jesus Christ. You need it. Ask God for forgiveness of your sins, thinking that you're actually a little bit better than someone else around you. My goodness, we all need Jesus. We all need encouragement. But that's the incredible thing that you become the hands and feet of Jesus to go out and tell people, hey, we all understand what the prison of captivity of shame is on some way, shape or form. It doesn't matter what it looks like. It's understanding there's a greater purpose and meaning for your life. And it's living for Jesus Christ. Amen. Ron, let's now talk about Adult and Teen Challenge. Tell us about how it began and what this ministry has grown to become. I'm such a huge fan, and I'm so excited for all of you to hear all about Teen Challenge. Oh, thank you so much, Nick. Well, Teen Challenge started uh, in 1958 in New York City. Uh, a, a wonderful brother named David Wilkerson uh, literally heard the call of God to go to New York City. Uh, to help some gang members who were on trial for a brutal murder. And as a result of him obeying the Holy Spirit, God led him to the streets of New York, and he began to minister to disaffected youth. And, uh, and Teen Challenge was literally birthed on the streets of New York City. Uh, Teen Challenge is now in about 120 plus countries around the world uh, and in every state of the United States. 
Uh, we have residential programs for adults and adolescents, uh, men and women, uh, to get off drugs and alcohol. Uh, even some of our Teen Challenge programs have uh, men, uh, women and children together go through recovery um, and whole family restoration. And it's absolutely miraculous to see what God does. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, I've been with the ministry now for, for 20 years, but really what makes Teen Challenge work um, is discipleship and evangelism. Those are the two pillars of the ministry. We don't just sit and wait for people to give us a call, uh, but we go out to the street where people are struggling. We go into neighborhoods where people are, are, are dealing with addiction and we invite them. We go to churches and uh, all kinds of social clubs, anywhere that people invite us to the school system. And we let people know that there's a way out, that there's hope, uh, they can get out of their addiction and they can live the life of purpose, destiny and dignity for which God created them. And we work with uh, teens and young people as well as adults. Uh, and it's just been amazing. Here in Southern California, uh, next year, we're having our Diamond Jubilee. We're celebrating 60 years of Teen Challenge Ministry in Southern California. We started in 1963 in Los Angeles. And as you mentioned earlier, we now have 10 different locations and we're looking to expand even further uh, because the, the addiction crisis is growing, especially with the opioids and the fentanyl and, and all these other things that continue, the designer drugs, if you will, that continue to captivate people's imagination and destroy their lives. So we don't rest on the accomplishments that we've had for the last 60 years, but we're looking to reach out even more. And then when they come into Teen Challenge, we have a systematic discipleship program where they learn who they are in Christ. They learn who God is. They learn why they were created and what their purpose is. And so we don't really focus on all of the addiction modalities, but we focus on life transformation uh, and how God can take a life that is broken and shattered and he can put it back together again and make something absolutely wonderful and glorious out of every life for whosoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And so it's really Christian discipleship in a, in a, a residential setting. It's a year long, very structured program, because one of the things that happen in addiction is people lose all of the pillars of their life. So they have to learn how to live life all over again. You know, how to get up in the morning, how to take a shower, uh, how to feed themselves, how to take care of themselves. And so we walk them through these things step by step, and they have a whole year to practice uh, living a life of purpose, a life of responsibility again with the help of the Holy Spirit and with a bunch of people around them who love them, who care for them, who encourage them so that they can walk into the freedom of the new life that God has for them. It's amazing. At age 19, I went to Toowoomba, Australia, in the state of Queensland, Ellen LeMay Teen Challenge. I know Katalin from Romania Teen Challenge and how he's picking up street kids, sniffing glue on the street and evangelizing and discipling um, those uh, 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 children as well. Uh, as a Californian resident for almost 20 years, um, was in the LA one, uh, but man, the Ventura County uh, women's one, yes. loves them up there. Oh my goodness. Oh, Nick, they uh, love you too. <laughs> man, I miss them. Uh, but I remember uh, me going up there on a very spiritual low, emotional low. Uh, mental low, um, I remember in 2011, um, and it was so hard to imagine that out of such an emotional, psychological, spiritual, mental low, that I'm now supposed to get up on stage and talk about the hope found in Christ, which I can because I know there is hope. And I always love that message where it, despite what you know, despite what you see, despite what you feel, God is hope and Jesus loves you and his promises are true. But man, I tell you, when as Teen Challenge teaches these amazing saints, uh, people who've been redeemed, um, how to sing and worship, uh, man, I mean, I'll never forget crying uh you know and and just tears streaming down during the worship and they could see i was so moved 
that they just sang more before Nick got up and, you know, shared the message for the day. But man, it is, uh, for me, one of the most incredible ministries of authentic change, redemption, passion, very strong discipleship, very strong program. And um, I know that, and I, and I echo it, it is a true move of God. Teen Challenge is a true move of God. And um, look, Ron, you know, maybe someone has gone through other recovery programs and said, ah, it didn't work, wasn't for me, and they're still struggling with addiction. Tell us why Teen Challenge absolutely sets itself apart as a ministry as to other uh, programs out there in the world? Well, it's because we believe in transformation through the power of the Holy Spirit. Uh, it's not a, a psychological model. It's not a medical model. Uh, it's not a, a, a just a social model, but it's a really a transformational model uh, that is in the Bible. Um, I often say that Teen Challenge is that part of the church who works with people who have substance abuse issues because it's the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's the power of the gospel that transforms people. We know that we're not strong enough, smart enough, or powerful enough to break anyone free from addiction. But when we get them to Jesus, you know, I think about those friends who uh, let their friend down on the stretcher when Jesus was ministering, when they tore the roof off the house and they let their friend down because they knew if they got their friend to Jesus, he was going to get some help. And that's what we do is every day we're letting people down on the stretchers of our faith into the throne room of God and God by the Holy Spirit introduces himself to them and they are forever changed. Uh, and that's what happens. And, and it's not just in a moment, but for the rest of their lives, he promised that he would never leave us and never forsake us. So it's not something that happens in a moment and then that's it. But it's for the rest of your life that you have many, many moments with the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we teach people how to walk with the Lord, how to read his word, uh, their scripture memorization, so that there's something they can anchor their lives to. Because the winds and the storms of adversity of life do not stop for a person that comes to Teen Challenge. As a matter of fact, they rage sometimes even more. And so it's continuing to be disciple by the Holy Spirit for the rest of your life. Yes, you're transformed. You're no longer a drug addict. You're now a child of God. Uh, you're no longer bound by addiction, but now you're free in Christ to be the person that God called you to be. But you have to keep walking with him. You can't sit down. It's walk. It's a walk of faith. It's a walk of trust. It's a walk of love. It is a walk with Jesus for the rest of your life. And so that's what we teach our folks, that you don't graduate from Teen Challenge after a year and say, okay, everything is great. I can now just coast in life. But we want you to hunger and thirst for the Lord. We want you to hunger and thirst for his word. We want you to hunger and thirst to be in his presence, to hunger and thirst to be with him. And it's that hunger and thirst that propels us forward and pulls us forward into all the future that God has for us. Yes, there are struggles. Sometimes folks struggle after they get out of the program, but they know where to go. They know where the fountain of, of hope is, the fountain of joy. So they go back to the Lord over and over and over again. Isn't that what we all do as, as Christ followers? We have to keep going to the Lord over and over and over again. And so they learn that God loves them, that God welcomes them, that God invites them. And when they are struggling, they can always go back to the throne room of God. And that's why Teen Challenge works is because it's not uh, a gimmick but it is a lifestyle transformation of following the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And, and if you're Catholic or if you're Orthodox uh, and, and you believe in the Holy Trinity, but you're only going to church twice a year and you know that God loves you and they talk about the prayers of the saints, read the, the Holy Word. What Ron just said is, these people devour the holy word, the scripture, the scripture that is second to none, second to none, and number one, where there is no second <laughs> either. Uh, that too, there are some 
other professing religions where, oh, the Bible's number one, but this is number two. No, there's no number two, and there's no number one other than the Bible. And it is it is the hungering of 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 his presence to be with him. Your priests might be talking about the saints, but not talking about Jesus and not actually reading the Bible. You've got to read the Bible. It's those promises in the Bible which anchor you through, not prayers, not, sorry, but not candles, um, not remembering your, your ancestors and praying for them. No, it, you've got to read the Bible. You really must understand what does the Bible say? If Jesus is Lord, then do you know the book of John? Have you memorized scriptures? Have you seen how Jesus lived? What he did for those afflicted and addicted? It's more than just being at a church or having a religion or, or lighting a candle. It's knowing him. It's being transformed. That's what it's all about. And if you haven't been transformed, start reading your Bible. Read in the book of John. Ron, we know that addiction causes a, a, a ton of distress, obviously, not only for the person struggling with substance abuse, but also for loved ones. What advice would you give to family or friends um, of someone battling addiction today? No one goes through addiction alone. Uh, the entire family is involved in some way. Uh, either you're an enabler, uh, you're giving money to prop up the situation, or you're ignoring it, you're running away from it, um, you're, you're wringing your hands, you're fretting. Everyone is involved when a family member is addicted. And it's very important that you don't isolate. As I mentioned earlier, that uh, addiction is a very isolated kind of activity. Sometimes when shame comes, the family will isolate pull away from the pillars of support that they have. So I would say reach out to get some support for yourself. Don't try to battle this alone. Uh, first of all, it's an opportunity for you to recalibrate your own relationship with God. As you see your loved one struggling, you can really increase your own prayer life, your own Bible reading, your own devotion to the Lord. But reach out and allow other people uh, to be a part of your life who, who love you, who care for you, and who are walking the path of righteousness so that they can stand with you. You know, one can put a thousand to flight, two can put 10,000. Uh, we need other people with us. Um, and I think one of the worst things that we can do as a family is to just feel like we have to, you know, kind of bite our lip and, and go through this by ourselves and hope against hope that something will happen. You know, I heard someone say one time, well, all I need is God. Yes, you do need God, but God says we also need other people. He says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. So it's very important that you don't isolate. The book of Proverbs says a man who isolates himself rages against all wise counsel and judgment. So receive other people. Let them know the, the family secret, if you will, of someone who is addicted so that you can have encouragement. Everyone needs someone to speak encouragement and hope and peace into uh, difficult situations. And so don't don't be alone. Find someone in your community, uh, a Bible-believing church, uh, someone who cares uh, about those who are broken by life circumstances and allow someone to stand with you. There's probably a teen challenge somewhere near you. Uh, reach out to them and just ask for prayer, um, and they would love to be a part of your journey. Run. Someone's watching right now with some kind of addiction. Speak to them right now. If you are addicted right now, I want you to know that there is hope. There is help. There is a way out. Oh, I know you may feel hopeless. You've tried many things and it has not worked. And you think that that's the end of your story. But I want you to know that God is the author of your story. He created you and he set you on the course of life with a purpose and a destiny in mind. But addiction and sin has brought you far, far away from that plan that God had. But God still loves you. He's calling you to come home to his presence because he cares for you. 
You can just call on his name. You say, well, do I have to be in a special church? Do I need to light a candle? No, all you have to do is just say, Lord, help me. The psalmist David said, I look to the hills from whence come my help. My help doesn't come from the hill, but it comes from the maker of the hill. It comes from God who made all things. And just call out and say, God, help me. You say, well, I don't know him. That's okay. He knows you because he created you and he loves you. So call on him and he will hear and he will answer your prayer and he will send you help from the sanctuary of of his presence. His Holy Spirit will come. He'll orchestrate your footstep to walk into the path of someone that you can trust, that you can open up to and begin to share the burden of your heart. This is not the end of your story. It doesn't end with addiction, but it ends with freedom. It ends with release. It ends with victory. It ends with love. It ends with purpose. It ends with thriving and not just surviving. God didn't create us just to get by, but he wants us to really thrive and be fully involved in every way with our lives. Call on him today. You're not alone. God is right there. You say, well, I don't see him. Where is he? He's there. He's everywhere. David said, I can take the wings of the morning and try to fly away, or I could go to the depths of the sea. There's no place I can go that he's not there. Just call on him. He will hear and respond to your humility, and he will bring help to you. And reach out and let someone know what is happening in your life. Amen. Ron, would you pray for that person right now and the families who have members of the family uh, affected with addictions right now? Absolutely. Father, thank you for your great love that calls you to send your only begotten son into the world. He came to look for sinners. He came to look for addicted folks. He came to look for broken people. He didn't come for those who were well, but he came for those who were sick. And Lord, today we feel sick. We feel broken by addiction. As family members, we feel helpless and hopeless because we cannot cause our loved one to walk into freedom. Lord, I pray right now that you will speak your words of hope. Lord, that you will cause faith to be birthed. You say you give to each one of us a measure of faith. Let that measure of faith be stirred in the hearts of the family members of those who have a loved one who's addicted. And Lord, I thank you that as they gather themselves, that you, the God of all hope, the God of all comfort, the God of all peace, Lord, will begin to instill in them a a joy and a peace to know that they will get through it. This is not the end. It is not over. So Holy Spirit, surround that loved one. Holy Spirit, surround that family. Holy Spirit, touch them. And I thank you that you reveal the truth to them. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus, reveal yourself to them in the midst of their situation, just as you did the Apostle Paul as he was on the road to Damascus, you revealed yourself. I thank you that you're the same God with the same glory, and you're the same yesterday, today, and forever. So Lord, do it once again for those who are struggling today so that they can find the hope, the freedom, and the release that comes through the power of the Lord Jesus Christ. For it is in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. And amen. Ron, thank oh, you yes. so much for joining us today. Thank you, Nick. It was a great joy to be with you. If dear someone brother. wants to know more about Teen Challenge, where can they go? Well, for us in Teen Challenge Southern California, just go to teenchallenge.org. We also have a 24 hour prayer line. Uh, that they can call. We have a a staff member who's there 24 seven. They won't talk to a computer, but they will talk to a person. This is something we started about three years ago in the midst of the pandemic. And Nick, we're carrying it on. uh, And they can call us at 888-520-0620. And there's someone there 24 seven to talk to them. Awesome. If you who are watching know someone uh, who's uh, battling addiction, we invite you um, to also visit champions for the brokenhearted on our website www.lifewithoutlimbs.org where you can actually 
not just see all the teen challenge resources and links and hotline number right there right now, uh, but also a message that I record straight to the afflicted and addicted and those who are drowning in their shame uh, and isolated addiction right now and, and status of their heart who just need to know that God loves them. And this ain't the end of their story. Uh, Ron, thank you for joining me. And thank you all who are watching for watching. Thank you for praying for us. Thank you for fasting for us and our team. And the mission here of Champions for the Brokenhearted, a life without limbs production. God bless you. And we'll see you soon.